Happy Friday and welcome to another edition of the Debrief Podcast presented by FL1 News. It's your week in headlines, the most read stories, and a look beyond the lead. Uh, I'm Josh Durso, joined today by Jackie Augustine and Trailblazers Pack founder Leslie Danks. Burke, that's a mouthful. It always is. You've been on my show three different times and it's always a mouthful. Uh, we're going to be taking a little different tact on today's show. Uh, we're going to be focusing on elections, politics, uh, but specifically the, the forecast for 2019 and what that looks like. Um, not just breaking down the, the last week's headlines. So thank you both uh, for being here. This has been something that we've been working on, it seems like, for the last three or four months. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited that we have Leslie here. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have talked, I mean, I know we got to speak briefly on election night about some of the the changes we're seeing locally with people getting, you know, kind of throwing their hat in the ring. But I think, you know, your work with Trailblazers, which I'll let you explain in your own words. I don't, I don't want to take that from you. But I think that, you know, really helping people figure out how to go forward when they get that feeling that something's not right and they want to be part of making it better. Yeah, it's uh, it's wonderful to be on your show. Thanks so much, Josh and Jackie. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate what, what you folks do to get information out to uh, community members about what's going on in, in our community. And at Trailblazers Pack, we support candidates who are running for local office. So we're really interested in getting people involved at that hyper-local level, town boards, county legislatures, village mayors, um, who those are the folks who really make decisions that affect our day-to-day -day lives, right? That's uh, the people who set your property taxes. That's who decides where your kids are going to go to school. That's who decides whether the potholes are going to be filled. And so we support candidates at that level, regardless of what political party they come from. We're nonpartisan, as long as they take a stand for clean government. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're pretty excited about the change that a lot of our trailblazers are making out there in the community. So one of the things we're obviously going to get in depth on what you guys do um, and sort of the successes and, and things you've learned over the last two, three years. Um, but, but first, I wanted to throw a question out to both of you. Um, what is the, the biggest expectation that you have now looking forward to November's elections 2019? What is the one biggest expectation that you have this coming year? Um, you mean hope or... <laughs> I, I, no, realistic expectation, because I think despite the fact that we're going to be talking about a lot of um, optimistic and hopeful things, a lot of right. folks are still going to be just sitting there listening and saying, eh, I've heard it all before. This, is, this yeah. is not anything new. Well, I mean, I think we've talked about frequently that, you know, I have this philosophy of like trickle up expectations that the people that you elect locally help the local community determine what they expect or tolerate in government, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you have a well-functioning local government, then I think you're more likely, I have no data to support this <laughs> assertion, so let me just say that. This is just my feeling that if things are run well locally, then people hold their potential candidates to a higher standard for higher offices. When things are running re really poorly locally, then I think it's easier for um, what I would consider to be more questionable candidates to get a foothold um, and kind of build on a feeling of um, distrust in government or a, a kind of... Um, backroom dealing method of doing business and people if they're disengaged locally or they feel like well that's just what government is then they end up electing people who carry those bad habits forward i think you're exactly right and that philosophy that feeling of yours is a big part of what trailblazers back is built on uh, we're interested not just in candidates running for local office who may then be in the pipeline to run for higher office. I mean, that happens, right? Uh, sometimes people run for local office and then a few years later they run for higher office. And, and we hope that those standards that they adhere to at the local level, they'll carry forward with themselves personally. But also exactly what you're talking about, that even if they don't run for higher office, by virtue of being um, more accountable and, and putting their voters first and really defining at the local level a, a system of representative de democracy that we're supposed to have, right. um, that holds the people higher up accountable as well. Uh, and, and I think that 
your question, Josh, is really interesting. What expectation do we see in 2019? Well, 2019 is a local election year. There aren't going to be state level candidates elected. There aren't going to be congressional candidates elected. But I see a real resurgence in uh, engagement in politics in in Americans yes, today. Definitely. And I don't think that's going to go away just because it's a local election year. So what's the outcome? People are going to be engaged in their local level offices. And that's an exciting thing to me. I, I think we should see an expectation that people are going to be asking What's up with these candidates running in 2019? Because right. those folks are just as important. Right. No, I agree. That That is definitely my hope. So it's interesting that you guys say that because the one thing that I have heard thus far is that there is a lot of concern from folks on both sides of the aisle that there just might not be enough bodies to cover the lineup in some communities. Um, well, there, there and, never is. I mean, it's really extraordinary how... Few races in New York State are contested at all. Um, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, the incumbent in office runs again unopposed without anybody running against them. Mm -hmm. And then very often, especially in Western New York, um, where, where you know it's a more sparsely populated community, often you will see no one step up to run. So maybe the incumbent doesn't want to do it anymore. He or she retires and nobody steps up on either side of the aisle. And so you have a vacancy with nobody running. And in those cases, uh, usually what happens is the existing body can point some, uh, someone to fill the vacancy. Well, that's not democracy, right? That's no, not no. And, I mean, the we voters just, participating. We just we talked about that on the show a little while ago, that there was a supervisor in Wayne County who had kind of come into the office in that way through an appointment process. And then um, there was a big question about whether or not he was actually attending the meetings and kind of fulfilling those duties. So I, I do think that I'm hopeful that people are paying closer attention and understanding, like you were saying, local government is where it's at. That is your day-to-day -day experience of government, and it really does affect your everyday life um, in the most critical ways. So I am hoping that people will see that stepping up to serve in that capacity is in and of itself a good, noble enterprise, mm -hmm. um, but also, like you said, serves this larger community function of helping people stay engaged or re-engage with, with local government. How do you, so how do we, I guess the question for especially small communities, how do you sell the value in that? Because I think one of the, one of the big challenges that local government has, especially in that vein, is actually putting value in the, the locally elected offices that ultimately either go empty or filled by folks who maybe don't have the best intentions or you know some other variation of that how do you how do you put value uh, back in it when some folks are going to look at this and say it, it's just too messy i mean i've heard people say that in seneca falls using seneca falls as an example i've also heard people say that in the city of geneva yep. you know in ontario uh, ontario county at large the perception that, that politics is just too messy, they don't want to get involved, they don't want to invest the personal capital that they ultimately have to, to get involved. What is the, the sort of, how do we get back to selling that? And Leslie, maybe you're, the, maybe you're the one who's actually doing that already. So talk us through well, the, it if that's the case. The two biggest barriers that we hear when we're trying to work with candidates and, and encourage them to run for local office or even just to get involved, show up to their local town board meetings and participate uh, as engaged citizens. The biggest barriers we hear are one, it's too contentious. It's too vitriolic, right? It's too much anger and I don't wanna be fighting with my neighbor who lives down the block. Um, you know, and we, we can talk about that, whether it's, it's more contentious at the local level or at the national level, I, I don't know. And then the second piece that we hear is, it's too complicated. I don't know that I have the background. I don't, I don't know enough to speak up. I think that's really interesting because people don't seem to have that hesitation about federal level politics. People are, are willing to express an opinion. Uh, and people are, in the last cycle, willing to run for office. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw uh, in, the, in the region that, that we're physically located in right now, we saw, I think at one point, there were 12 different right. candidates stepping up to run for Congress on the Democratic side against the Republican incumbent. Um, I didn't get the sense that those folks 
were, were really concerned about whether they had the background knowledge to serve in Congress. But so often we hear, you know, I just don't understand what a local government official does. I, I can't read those budgets. I haven't participated in local zoning decisions. Zoning's complicated. Tax, tax policy's complicated. I don't know how to do that. What we say back to our candidates is, listen, if you're engaged in this community, if, you, if you've been living here and paying taxes, you see how it affects you. You right. can learn this stuff. Uh, you're, you're a participant. You can get educated on this. I have a less, uh, much less diplomatic pitch that I make to people when they're interested in local <laughs> government, and I just say two things. First of all, I say, all right, usually when people are asking me about what it's like and that they want to get involved, um, it's because they know that I was in local office. And I say, look, at, I mean, you know, I ran um, when I was 20, and that was... At, you know, I came in, I had no prior political experience, and overall, I think I did a decent job. So clearly, the learning curve is not insurmountable. There you go. Um, but then the second... That's pretty diplomatic. Well, that's my, that's my start. <laughs> then I come in with what is my less diplomatic thing is, I say, take a look at the people currently doing it. I understand you might not think they're doing everything correctly, but government is functioning. And if you look at the people that are currently in there, you might say, I'm pretty sure I could handle whatever it is they're handling right now. Yeah. So if you are, um, if, if you look at who currently holds the seats, right? I mean, I'm an ethics person, so I always end up quoting Plato, which is to kind of not a direct quote, but the worst thing is to be governed by people who know less than you do. So if yeah. you look at the current board and you think, I have at least as much competency as the people currently serving, then you're, you're ready. You can do yeah. it. Well, and one of the real uh, challenges, I think, and one of the things that we're trying to do at Trailblazers Pack to open things up, is that the system is designed to keep people out right? Uh, and there's, there's information that happens in the back room that isn't accessible to the public. And the folks who are in the club of knowing what is happening have an advantage mm -hmm. over the run-of-the-mill voter who doesn't know what's happening. And so that, that barrier of knowledge that it, I think in, in a lot of ways, bureaucratically because the system is designed that way, or in some cases purposefully because people are keeping information away from their voters, um, that that creates a sense on the part of voters that, oh, there must be a whole lot of information there that I don't know and I can't get access to, and so I must not be qualified. Right. So a couple things I want to key in there uh, on. Uh, one, on the too complicated argument side, um, can you, if you are holding a, a congressional seat, for example, can you get away with being less informed because of the heap of news that's just constantly coming out about congressional offices and congressional candidates and, and elected office holders uh, versus a town board member who might be under a little more of a microscope because it's just a town board. Well, and that's why local journalism is so important, right? I mean, here's a plug for you, Josh and Jackie, and what, and what you're doing. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. There's so much more information available about what's happening at the national level than there is at the hyper local level. You know, right. you can you have to dig a little bit to find out what the you know the tax policy plan is or what the zoning plan is. Sometimes those minutes aren't even posted. Sometimes they aren't even generated. We have uh, one trailblazer candidate out in Dutchess County. We we support candidates all over the state. And we have one candidate who won his election two years ago uh, in Dutchess County for Dutchess County Legislature. And he realized pretty quick, uh, his name is Chris Munn, he realized pretty quick that there are no minutes recorded at all from these uh, committee meetings that he's going to. They, they just don't exist. It's not that they can't be publicized or, or posted. Nobody's taking minutes. And so he's introduced legislation twice to try to get uh, minutes recorded of these committee meetings and both times that's been voted down by the existing legislature to to <laughs> even record minutes at all hmm. he's still trying right he's mm -hmm. he's pushing hard for that that's the kind of candidate that we support at trailblazers pack and that's that's what we're pushing for and we're delighted that when they 
uh, take that kind of action during their campaign, then they, they end up being likely to continue that once they're elected to office, like Chris has been. Um, but when those minutes aren't available for the public, yeah, it's really hard to figure out the information. Right. So then the, the opposite side of that, I've and maybe we've talked about this before, but one of, one of my biggest pet peeves, and this year is going to be no exception, I'm sure, uh, as I sit down with, with folks who are running for office, the, the one thing that I'm almost guaranteed to hear at some point during the conversation is, I'm really looking forward to learning about this job. I'm really looking forward to learning about this position. That, as, in, as somebody who, who considers themselves pretty darn connected to politics and how it works and everything like that, and just knowing that it doesn't take too much to really start to figure out how things work, mm -hmm. it drives me crazy when I hear that. It drives me absolutely crazy because that does not instill confidence in voters. And that's where you get those, in my opinion, you get those folks who are entrenched with the party who don't convey that kind of messaging. And all of a sudden they look like the, the more developed, the better candidate, the one who actually knows what they're doing. And is that, am I being too critical or is that something that is just a reality when you're talking about local politics where folks, you know, maybe they aren't uh, completely connected and completely educated, but they have the, the intent is there. So I'm trying to figure out which piece of that bothers you. It bothers you that the, the candidate the response, is... The actual response. I've been candid about that before. I think if, if your answer to what you're most looking forward to about a and being an elected official is learning about the job... To Maybe me, you should have just, done that learning before you got That learning in the race. should have happened before you entered the race or at the very least should be happening while you're running. And by the time you get there, you're able to start because that is one of the things. I mean, how many times have we listened to folks complain about Seneca Falls, Geneva, Seneca County, Ontario County, Wayne County, they just aren't doing anything. That's the thing we hear yeah, all the time. Yeah. It's like maybe that's the fact, but voters... So I, I would take that concern that you have and, and move it just from candidates onto voters. Um, and we as voters have a real responsibility to hold our elected officials accountable. So if... Uh, I, I really resist the idea that any individual candidate can save us from a particular, you know, civic yeah. debacle that's about to right. happen. And and I think that voters um, tend to want that to be the case, right? They're always looking for the best candidate and, and who's the most winnable and who's most likely to win this race and who's going to sway everybody's mind and, you know, ride in on a white horse and, and fix this whole situation. Actually, that's our responsibility as voters. Uh, we're supposed to know what's going on. That's what a democratic republic is. Uh, we pick people who then are our representatives and you know make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're all supposed to be engaged enough to be good bosses right. of those people. That Thank you for calling the people the bosses of the elected officials because this has been a recurring theme that has has really bothered me. Just speaking at, about our observations on the local level, it is clear to me that once people get elected to a public body, um, with rare exceptions, there becomes this attitude that they're in charge, they will tell people what to do, they will restrict public comment, they will um, restrict access to information, that somehow the people need to stay over here so mm -hmm. that they can do their job. Mm -hmm. And it's a real inversion of power because I think people forget that an elected official has been hired by the people of that area to gather information, to push that information back out into the community so that there can be a robust public discussion about it, and then to implement sound decisions that are in the best interest of the community. Right. Not just what seems to be the majority opinion, but an actually well-reasoned, well-informed position. And that seems to be what's lacking. And I, I think it, it ties into that sentiment where people are looking for the ideal candidate that's going to run government correctly for us. And that that frustrates me. I mean, after the mayoral race, a lot of people, you know, came up to me and said, oh my goodness, it's terrible. Like, Geneva really needed you to be the mayor. And I'm like, no, Geneva needs you to actually go to some meetings and to speak at public comment yeah. and to say, this is what we think is the right way to proceed. 
and then hold people accountable if they don't do that. Make them exactly. explain their position, why they're not doing that. But I think there is this idea that, you know, there's voters play into the perception that the elected officials are in charge. And I think we need to start reversing that. Um, because I'm not talking about like some kind of radical populism where it's just kind of a vote taking free for all, you know, where where you've got a poll for everything. But what I am saying is that, um, you know, that the person living in their neighborhood has just as much right and responsibility to be engaged at public meetings as the people that are elected do. And that's how that to use your word, trickle up process works, right? So if we're engaged with our local representatives, then our local representatives, when they go into those um, dark rooms with folks right. above them, they're going to know I've got people back home who are going to hold me accountable mm -hmm. and, and they're going to be good stewards for us at the next level up. And it's, and it's going to move its way right. up the ladder. Right. Yeah, I think that's... So then I, I guess what I want to expand a little bit on there then is just talk a little more about the, the referendum aspect because I think we do hear that quite a bit. I've heard it a lot in Seneca County with regard to the landfill. Just just take a public vote. Just find out what the public actually wants. Sounds like you're pushing back against that a little bit, saying that's not always the, the simplest and best way to move forward. Sometimes you do actually need to figure out what's factually the best and move forward that way. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of referendums because I, I feel like it is legislative punting because you're you're taking what should be your job, which is to assemble information, have, you know, do ward meetings, get feedback, and then assemble an argument that supports a, a good conclusion and let that be tested. Um, I, I think that the reason so many people are calling locally for a referendum on the landfill is that they don't understand why their elected officials continue to support something that many people believe is in is against our best interest. So I think what they're actually asking for are the elected officials to come out and say, this is why we think continuing to support the trash industry in the tourism capital of New York, um, you know, upstate New York, why that makes sense. I think we all know it doesn't make sense. We can feel that it doesn't make sense. But because the elected officials are never willing to explain their votes, right? We have elected officials across the Finger Lakes that will take a vote and never say why they are voting that way. I think that's what stirs people up and says, wait, it makes them say, wait a second, we should take a referendum because you're not reflecting our values because they sense there's something missing. I think what's missing is the debate. I think what's missing is the accountability and the discussion that comes when a legislator has to explain why they voted a certain way. But that is something we could ask for. That is something we could demand. It's not necessarily something that has to be turned back to, over to us for a vote. And it's a it's a bipartisan problem or a, a nonpartisan right. problem, yes. right? Nonpartisan is the word we use at Trailblazers Pack because um, we're agnostic on party. And that's when you look at the landfill question. Folks want it to be explained, this, this challenge that you're describing, this, this, there's no there there on the why. You can't yes. understand why someone's voting that way. People want that to be explainable by political party. And so, you know, that seems to be like an easy out. Oh, it's the Democrats fighting with the Republicans or it's... it's you know, the Republicans fighting with the Democrats. But on that particular issue, it's not, right? right? That one doesn't make any sense in a two-party um, depiction of, of the argument because that trash is coming from New York City, right. which is controlled by Democrats. So how come the upstate Republican legislators are voting with the downstate Democratic right. legislators in order to funnel this trash? It's larger than party the exactly. benefit that's happening there and and how come the upstate republican senators who are supposed to be representing their constituents aren't fighting for their constituents against the downstate democratic senators so people see that there's a challenge there and there, there's a lot of questions and they want those questions answered i think you're right and so they're, they're calling for a referendum in order to get the data right in order to get the facts right there's other ways we can get the facts though yeah 
I think we should talk about... Does that mean more watchdog groups? Does that mean more specific types of action from different organizations within, say, subcommittees of like a town board or something like that? What, what are some of the things that you guys think are necessary to kind of get that ball rolling in the right direction? Well, I think um, campaign finance is one of the... So we've talked over and over about this LLC loophole mm-hmm. and how um, these corporations can form or special interest groups can form these LLCs and make donations, which essentially are... It's, it's not that they're untrackable, um, but since an LLC does not need in New York State to list its full membership, um, it ends up being what I call like dark money, right? It's money that comes into campaigns that, for example, if you're the 23rd Street LLC based in New York City, I'm curious to know why you've consistently supported to the tune of two or three thousand um, dollars a, a year an upstate Republican senator. I don't. I don't understand that connection. So I think that following the money still continues to be the strongest need and the quickest way to build transparency in our in our local politics, even because it does affect us locally. We absolutely agree with that at Trailblazers Pack. And when we ask our candidates to stand for clean government, you know, any issue that you ask a candidate to make a campaign promise on, you you run the risk that they're going to make a promise and not follow through on it, right, once they're elected. Um, But we find ourselves really fortunate at Trailblazers Pack because our issue, which is clean government, there's a way to test them during their campaign on whether they're actually going to walk the talk on that. And the way to test them is to look at how they handle their campaign finances during Mm -hmm. the campaign. And so what we ask candidates to do is fully disclose all of their campaign donations, even if the law doesn't require them to. So like the LLC loophole that you're describing, Mm -hmm. even if um, it's not required to divulge where all of that money is coming from, in order to be a Trailblazers candidate, you have to. You have to you have to go on to the financial filing website and in addition to everything the state is asking you to disclose disclose the rest of it too um, and one of the pieces that we found and uncovered it at trailblazers through a bunch of research that we did this year that was really interesting in addition to the LLC loophole is what we're calling the unitemized contributions mm. loophole and this is um, especially in very local races people will donate $99 or less right. to a candidate. Uh, and often folks who are in the know know that when you donate $99 or less, the state does not require you to divulge who that contribution came from right. as a candidate. And we ask our Trailblazers candidates to do that. $99 doesn't sound like a whole lot of money, right? But if your entire campaign budget costs $1,000, that's right. a full tenth of your campaign budget. So yes. wouldn't you want to know who's paying 10% of that candidate's budget? And in addition, it really builds up. Uh, we discovered that last year alone, there was over $30 million in unitemized contributions funneling into New York State uh, local level yeah. campaigns. Mm-hmm. I, that that's a surprise lot, me. Right. right? So one in every eight political dollars in New York state level campaigns comes from this unitemized contribution loophole. Well, if someone donates $99 or less, and then their sister does, and then their partner in their business does, Mm -hmm. and then, you know, the employees each do, and none of those are disclosed, pretty soon you're talking big money. Well, and I think we've seen that locally, too, with, with several financial disclosures. Another issue that we have in New York State is that the um, there is an infusion of money that comes in uh, between the final pre-election reporting and the first post-election reporting. Right. So a candidate is allowed to lend their campaign funds which they are then reimbursed for from outside sources. We saw that in our last state Senate race uh, where there was a, a, I call maneuvering of money. Um, I don't want to say manipulating of money. I'll just call it maneuvering. Uh, But there, there was a significant amount of money that appeared on the campaign filing to be a self-funded contribution, which when you looked at the post-election filing, you saw where that money had been repaid through these outside contributions that had come in and registered the week prior to the election. The last pre-election filing, I believe, is 14 days. And in that last 14 days, there are a lot of expenditures for those final mailings, phone calls, ads, 
and then you see where they were paid for after the candidate has already been elected. And when you have issues, at least upstate, when we're trying to figure out the amount of downstate influence on our elections, it's really concerning to see the downstate influence not appear until the post-election filing. So that's another point where our state election law could do a better job of requiring those disclosures, but there are so many loopholes in our campaign finance laws that enable people, if they are intent on gaming the system, to do so with, with relative ease. So, and it's, it's concerning. So my question is then, we, especially when we actually get into campaign season, we hear a lot of uh, make a 10, 15, 20, $30 donation. Right. Um, how, would you, how would you approach the folks who are saying, you know, I don't want to take, I don't want to be branded as a supporter of X candidate despite the fact, publicly, despite mm-hmm. the fact that I may just because of a 20 or $25 donation. And how do you sort of reconcile for the, the divide that exists and the grief that some folks would probably take for having their... Um, political donations exposed, and I'm talking. I'm not talking about the male side of it. I'm talking about you know the the average person who just happens to work wherever they aren't political, but their friends, their family, their coworkers, they may have some negative feelings towards them because they supported this candidate as opposed to that candidate. So this is a favorite topic of mine, and my response back is, why not? We're supposed to be engaged. Right. Democracy is about coming to the table and having a debate, right? We're all supposed to be participating in that debate. And if the way you're participating is by making sure that this voice is amplified by giving $30 to this particular candidate, you should be proud of that because that means you're engaging in democracy. And if the way you're participating is by giving $30 to both sides, let's say you're one of these folks who decides to donate to both sides, a lot of people do, be proud of that too, because that's a choice that you made. And if you're not proud of your participation in democracy, then maybe you should look at what that participation looks like if you're not willing to have that uh, out there in the community. But I think that um, one of the one of the things that we have lost as a result of of the dark money in politics is a real sense of ownership of the debate. We should be proud of coming to the table to work through our differences and argue through our differences. Heck, that's what this country was founded on. We don't have duels anymore. Um, (laughs) And that's probably a good thing uh, as as a way of resolving a debate on the legislative floor. But we're supposed to come and and have that healthy argument. And we should be proud of that because that's what we do. Uh, that's why we're not authoritarian. That's why we're yeah. not a monarchy. So, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, politics is not a private endeavor. It's not between you and your neighbor to talk about something, but you and your elected official neighbor to go have coffee together and make a deal, and then nobody knows the content of that conversation. Politics is public, so the campaign needs to be public, and people should know how people are lining up. And I think that, well, just in general, and this is what I tell my kids, right? You shouldn't have any secret opinions. You are a person of integrity. You should live your life by your values. And if people don't agree with them, that's fine. We are not all clones of one another. We shouldn't expect total agreement. But if we can't figure out as a society how to have debates and discussions and respect for people who don't agree 100% with us, then we really are eroding our democracy because we have to, we're all in this together. We don't, we aren't all of one mind, but we have to know how to just talk to each other and say, okay, you think that way, I think this way, maybe we'll discuss it, maybe we agree to disagree, maybe we both learn something. But that is how things advance as opposed to just devolving into... And look at what happens on social media sites, for example, with anonymous posts. Right. Once someone can hide behind anonymity, uh, the vitriol really goes up. Oh, right. Yeah. You can you can say really really nasty things if you're anonymous. Is there is there that much? You know, I can recall back to the the chat room days when there really was anonymity, and and now this is it seems a lot more brazen now, where folks are willing to get onto their sign onto their real personal Facebook accounts. We've seen a lot of that in the last week and just go to town 
and say things that frankly I don't think many people would say live. I think it's because we've lost that person to person connection because they they don't feel a sense that they're going to be held accountable for that, right? You can go say something really nasty on Facebook because you're never going to bump into the people who read it at the grocery store. I know with the work that I do, I mean, I travel all over this state into one community after another. Um, If I post something on Facebook that is cruel about a particular community or it's very possible that I'll walk into the grocery store in that community in a few weeks and have somebody say, whoa, I saw what you said and I don't like that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And we need to get back to (laughs) a level of civil engagement and civil discourse that we can all be proud of and responsible for. And that doesn't mean don't argue. In fact, it does mean argue. Argue those views passionately, but civilly. Is that possible in a world where that discourse is basically dominated by Facebook? I'm, I'm thinking, I'm comparing basically in my mind, Facebook engagement to voter turnout. And one of those numbers would be significantly higher than the other, and it's not voter turnout. Right. <laughs> and that, to me, is is this sort of goal or hope possible in a world where Facebook exists as it does now? So we might not be able to change that about Facebook as easily as we could change our engagement in politics. Um, we need to develop new rules and systems that allow more people to participate um, at in the conversation. The reason more people post on Facebook than vote is because it's easier to post on Facebook than to vote. Now, why is that? It should be easier to vote. It should be a lot easier to vote. Um, New York State is, is frankly very regressive mm-hmm. in terms of how hard it is to get to the polls, um, depending on where you live, whether you've moved in the last year, you know which political party you're with. You, you have to have all of these little boxes checked months in advance before you can show up to vote. Should not be that hard. Right. We should make it just as easy to get to the polls and express your opinion there as it is to go express your opinion on a social media platform. So that's one of the things we were going to talk about today. New York says they're going to they're going to deal with that. They're going to address that this year. Um, Democrats have complete control over all of the the necessary things to be able to make that happen. I think complete is a stretch, but yes, they have all three as branches. complete as ever exists in politics. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so with that being said, are we optimistic about the changes that could potentially happen in the next year and a half to two years before we do elections again? I think if we hold the Democrats accountable, we can't sit back and say, oh, look, now all those Democrats got elected who campaigned on this platform of increasing voter engagement. Now we can trust them to just go do it. And so right. we'll go on and, and you know do our grocery shopping and pay our electrical bills and show up to Girl Scout and PTA meetings and trust that they're going to handle it. No, that's not enough. We have to stay on top of them and make sure that they actually follow through and and do those things that they said they were going to do. Is it early voting? Is it what what are the individual components that could be helpful in getting more people to vote? Early voting seems to be the one that people talk about most. Um, it does it have to I do think with all right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree. I think it's the entire bundle. Um, I, I don't know if there's one in particular that that jumps out at me besides early voting as being something that would be particular. I mean, they're they're all helpful. They're all things that we've been asking for. They're all things that the League of Women Voters has spent time investigating and advancing. Um, they all seem like sound policies to me. I do think early voting will be the most radical shift for people and understanding that um, when people realize at the last minute that they had a vacation scheduled or they have a doctor's appointment or they're gonna be out of town for the day on election day, a lot of times they've missed the window or they don't want to go through the kind of rigmarole of getting an absentee ballot and explaining why they're not gonna be able to make it to the polls. And in some cases, their reason for not being able to vote wouldn't qualify for getting an absentee ballot. And I, I think now the opportunity to say, okay, oh, there's an election coming up. I realize I'm not going to be here on Tuesday. Let me take care of this first before I go is going to make a, a, a huge difference. Or even not just I'm not going to be here on Tuesday, but, you know, oh, my my shift changed. And now I'm working from noon to 10. 
uh, at my right. retail job. And so I just, I just physically can't get there. I don't get my work shift right. schedule until Sunday night. I don't know if I'm going to be available right. on Tuesday or not. Um, that happens a lot. Yeah. It's interesting because I to sort of contrast what you said, I think I've heard a lot from a lot of Republicans who have said we already have early voting mechanisms. It is the absentee ballot process. That's a to me that seems like a cop out yes. where you're saying, you know, fill out an absentee ballot despite the I think there are some integrity issues mm -hmm. if absentees are still going to be called absentees. If you want to change the name of them to early paper or something like that, you know, go for it. But does that sort of because that was that was basically what Republicans said throughout last year when this was being debated the first time around. Right. And I mean, we saw in South Carolina the issues, some of the issues that come up with the handling of absentee ballots um, as they currently exist. And I do think that the early voting process will be a more secure process than the absentee ballot process may be, but also less cumbersome as far as proving that that is something that you need to do um, for people that are just legitimately trying to vote ahead of time. And also, if it's already there and it already works, then why the resistance? Right. You know, right. like, okay, well then let's just, let's just call it what it is. Let's make it work for everybody. So one of the questions that we kept seeing on social media, and we've seen it for probably like two years now, why, why don't more women run for office? And why does there seem to be, if there is a shortage, there is especially a shortage of, of female representation. Obviously, this last time around, um, the, the higher-up seats made out very well, uh, the state and congressional and Senate seats, but not, not locally, not, in the, not as much in the local scene, or at least it doesn't seem as much in the rural local scene. Mm -hmm. I think any group that has traditionally been uh, left out of the conversation, it's obviously going to be harder for them to get to the table. Um, if I if I may just put in a little plug for Trailblazers Pack here, we're, we're really proud that just by virtue of who we are, I think, and the message that we're espousing, we seem to attract more women candidates than men candidates, which, which is very interesting. We're not an organization that's particularly focused on recruiting women for office. Um, but I think that because what we do is break down those barriers and, and dismantle that that uh, sense that I don't have enough knowledge, I don't I don't have the skills, I don't have the capacity to do that. That's what we're all about is is telling people, no, actually you do, and we're here to help, and we're help you to here to help you find those answers. Um, we find that women, people of color, uh, folks from from backgrounds that traditionally are not participating in politics are apt to gravitate to us and we end up with with candidates um, across a, a real wide range of, of perspectives and that's exciting yeah I think I think that's great I I have found I mean in my experience I think that um, I'm trying to think of how to talk about this without insulting large swaths of people um, I, I think in general uh, on the local level, it's been my experience that men... So, but I will say that Geneva, when I first came on city council, um, you know, we had three women on city council. Geneva had just had a female mayor, which was our second female mayor. Um, but quickly, uh, I became the only woman on city council. And... Part of it was a function of youth, right? I understand that being 20 to 25 years younger than all your colleagues does create its own issues. Um, but I do know that there is, when people talk about the good old boys and the old boys network, um, that is not a misnomer. There are not a lot of women enter that are welcomed into the good old boys club. At, they shouldn't want to be there. No one should want to be there. It's not a fun place from what I can see. Uh, but the, I think that that barrier does exist where a lot of times in the traditional ways that candidates are selected, which are usually local committees who invite people in to talk about what their ideas are, there is sometimes, whether it's conscious or not, an interest in 
um, hearing what you have to say, incorporating that into a platform, uh, and putting those words into another guy's mouth. So that, I think, just helping female candidates um, understand that their ideas are valid and that why let somebody else speak the words that you're creating um, is is the way to to get more women into politics. It's not that women aren't interested in politics. It's not that women aren't participating in politics. It's that I think in a lot in a lot of ways women's voices have been co-opted by men um, to advance their their political agenda. Is there also an element of just needing some time for the numbers to actually sort of balance out. The wheels of government turn slowly. We saw a big increase this last time around. You'd expect to see another big increase the next time around. Is it sort of this idea that it, it they're, it's not going to happen overnight? We should expect this to take a couple cycles? You know, there's there's really interesting research on this. Um, 20% is a, is a barrier number. Uh, when you look at women's representation in legislative bodies, in gubernatorial seats, in, in Congress, women get up to 20% and then they kind of stall out there. And my personal theory on it is that at 20%, you still don't have enough women in the room to, to, to make eye contact and get, um, you know, get, get a group of people who are together supporting each other. Once you get past that 20% barrier and up to 30%, then the representation really starts to snowball. Um, if, you just, if you just look at uh, around the world, once women get up to 30%, then it really speeds up and they make it up to 50% a lot faster than they got from 20 to 30. And it may be because if you have that many more women in the room, you have colleagues and and people that you can look to for moral support when you when you bring up an idea there's another person in the room to say oh i heard what she said and validate that um, when an idea is presented so we we really need to get past that 20 percent barrier and who knows maybe in 2018 we started doing that maybe maybe we'll get up to 30 and then start to see this snowball so the next question is, and the last question, I think, uh, what's the call to action for folks who are listening? And, and you know, this is an important year on the local on the local scene. Uh, what's the call to action for the next seven to eight months as this really kicks into high gear? Um, I guess I would just say that there aren't many people who feel fully satisfied with the way their local government is working or the way their state or national government is working. And if you feel dissatisfied, you have a couple of options. You can ignore it, which I think in all our lives we've learned um, is not the right strategy when you're confronting an issue. (laughs) Um, Or you can do something about it. And at the most basic level, that's just to pay attention and to show up. But I think that there is not too much more effort required to step fully in and say, okay, I am going to put myself out there, if for no other reason than to elevate the level of debate, but hopefully to then get in there and elevate the level of governance. Mm -hmm. So I I definitely agree with that. Um, And I'd add this icing on the cake. It's fun, right? I mean, that's why we have a democratic republic is because we want to get to be the people making the decisions. Otherwise, we would just choose to be in a monarchy or a dictatorship. But that's not as much fun, right? It's really a good time to get to participate in deciding what the rules are going to be for your kids, your grandkids, heck, for for your life next week and whether that pothole is going to be filled or not. Um, And if we can get back to this sense that we participate in civic engagement, not just because it's our duty and our responsibility, but also because that's what we passionately hold dear as Americans, that that's that's what we believe in is every single voice counts and everybody uh, has has a stake in this. And we're we're all in this little boat out in the vast universe together. Uh, and and we, we got to own that. It's a good time. Mm-hmm. 
and Trailblazers, how can folks get involved? So run for office. If you're not going to run for office, get in touch with us and talk with us about how you can support somebody who is. Learn how your town board works. Uh, get involved, and, and we're here to help. And we also are here to donate to your campaign. If you're willing to uh, meet every one of our clean government standards, then you get to unlock matching funds through our organization uh, that will help you win your race. And, and we'd love to support more trailblazers all over the state. I, I think we're going to end up having to do this conversation again, say around June or July. Okay. Because I think as we keep getting closer to, to Election Day, I think this conversation, the scope of it's going to kind of mm -hmm. change and become a little more immediate for folks. Um, right now, still, unfortunately, we're we're locked into this con continual campaign stage, it seems, especially right. with some congressional races. Um, so some folks might be a little bit disengaged at this Exhausted. point. Exhausted. Fatigued. Yeah. A little tired. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we can't be too tired because we have village races coming up in March. Right. All over central and western New York, there's going to be a lot of village uh, candidates elected. That that might be another thing for New York State to look at. Do we really need to have elections all year long? Right. Do we have to have village races in March, the presidential primary in February, and then more village races in June, and then you have the congressional primaries, and then you have the state primaries in September, and then you have the general in November? Man, you can spend right. your whole life at the polls if you want to. <laughs> um, maybe we should consolidate some want. of this yeah. and, and save save uh, New York taxpayers a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, but the system we've got right now lets us participate in our village elections coming in, up in March. And we've already got trailblazer candidates who are running for those races and we're excited for them. All right. Well, thanks for coming up. And thanks, Jackie, again. Mm -hmm. As always, we made it through another episode. Mm -hmm. We survived. We're here. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, and we will it. be doing this again for sure. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Hope everyone has a great weekend. Uh, and we will see you next Friday right back here. Be great. well.